This presentation shows an example of the APV approach in merger valuation. The model shows the value of a levered firm to be the sum of two parts. The first is the value that the firm would have if it did not use debt, and that's the value of the unlevered firm. The second is the additional value the firm has on account of its use of debt, which is the present value of interest tax savings. Now, as you can see, the value of the unlevered firm is the present value of the projected free cash flows over the horizon, where in this case the discount rate is not going to be the weighted average cost of capital, it would have to be therefore cost of the unlevered equity. And then the present value of the interest tax savings is also going to be based on the cost of the unlevered equity. In some cases, analysts would use the cost of the firm's debt as the discount rate. So this is all summarized right here, where the value of the firm's operations, the intrinsic value of the firm would be the sum of these two components, uh, the present value of the free cash flows and the present value of the interest tax savings. To find the intrinsic value of the firm, therefore, we need these three ingredients. Projected free cash flows, calculated interest tax savings, and the cost of unlevered equity. Now, as you can see, if the firm uses no debt, then its value would simply be the present value of the projected free cash flows, which, in effect, the cost of equity for such a, an unlevered firm would naturally be the cost of the unlevered equity. But with the use of debt, then we, we would have to separately calculate the interest tax savings and then find their present value. So to find the cost of unlevered equity, one way is to use the CAPM, which in this case we would have to use unlevered beta. beta would be unlevered using the Hamada formula, which you see here, so that the numerator would be the firm's beta, which would be a levered beta, and then we divide by this quantity here, which includes the debts to equity ratio as well as the firm's tax rate. So, to summarize, to find the intrinsic value of a firm's operations, we need these two set of boxes. The red boxes contain your projections of the firm's free cash flows up to the horizon, at the, end, at the end of which we're going to have to find the unlevered horizon value using the constant growth rates. As well, for the blue boxes, we're going to have to estimate the firm's projected interest tax savings, which will be based on its projected debt balances over this period. At the end of which also, we calculate the horizon value interest tax savings. And in both cases, we're going to use the cost of unlevered equity as the discount rate, as you see there. Then finding the sum of the present values of these uh, red boxes and the sum of present values of these blue boxes, we find the value of the firm's operations. So let's show a quick example. Go ahead and read this mini problem set on your own. And the summary, in addition to additional data, are provided here. So first, you're going to have to project the revenues. In this example, over the next five years, it's uh, traditional, typical rather, to um, to lay out your projection uh, over a period not to exceed five years. More than five years, your projections become kind of fuzzy, and you don't really want to go below three years. Less than three years, your projections are going to be too abrupt. So anyhow, in this example, to find your to get your projections of revenues, three raw materials might be helpful to you, so to speak. One would be the historical pattern of the firm's uh, of the target firm's uh, sales, and uh, secondly would be your estimate of the synergistic benefits that would accrue if in fact this target firm is acquired by the acquirer, and thirdly would be your um, your view of the uh, strength of the economy going forward because in part uh, how a firm uh, performs in the future is in part reliant on how the overall economy is expected to perform. So these are some of the things that analysts will take into account to come up with their estimates of the firm's uh, revenues.
And then looking at historical relationship between cost of goods sold and revenues, you should be able to come up with uh, a good ratio, such as in this example, 60%. So 60% of these revenues represent your projected cost of goods sold. As well, you can get a sense as to the firm's operating costs ratio to sales and use that to lay out your selling and administrative expenses. And then depreciation is laid out. And then you calculate your EBIT, which going forward, you can now calculate your NOPAT, which is your after-tax EBIT. So now, given your personal, given your estimate of uh, incremental investments in operating capital, you're able to then come down here and calculate your free cash flows, which is your NOPAT minus your net investment in operating capital. As a reminder, free cash flow can be calculated in the way that I've just shown in this example, which is your NOPAT minus your net investment in operating capital. However, if your projected investment in operating capital is gross in that you have not accounted for depreciation, then you're going to have to go back and add depreciation back to your NOPAT. Actually, the sum of these two components is called operating cash flow. So if you're going to have to subtract your uh, gross investment in operating capital from this guy on the, on the left side, make sure that you are subtracting it from operating cash flow because then regardless of whether you use method one or method two you're going to come up with the same result a good estimate of free cash flow and then here based on the firm's debt levels over the next five years you're able to estimate interest expenses which is simply going to be your projected debt levels multiplied by the firm's interest rate and then multiplying the interest expenses by the firm's tax rate you find the interest tax savings and I have shown you the calculation for the first two years right down here so as a quick stop over here Suppose we have these additional data and keep in mind that the problem set indicates that the firm's debt is 1.5 million. The firm's market capitalization, which is market value of equity, is 2.8 million. So with these additional data, we're able to calculate uh, the, uh, the firm's unlevered beta to, to come up with 1.135 and then plugging that into the CAPM uh, equation right here, we find the firm's cost of unlevered equity to be 9.54. So in essence, this is saying that if the firm uses no debt, its cost of equity would have been 9.54%. If you wish to find the corresponding cost of uh, levered equity, just simply take 1.5 and plug it in here. So now we're pretty much on the home stretch. So now we calculate the horizon values for the free cash flows and for the interest tax savings to get these two numbers. To find these calculations, we're assuming a constant growth rate of 7.5%. Usually, such a growth rate would be based on what your view is of the firm's estimated long-term growth rate for earnings per share and free cash flows going forward. So it needs to be an informed judgment on your part. So now to summarize, the value of the unlevered firm, which is the present value of your estimated free cash flows, these are the substitutions and the solution. And for the interest tax savings, these are the substitutions and the final result. Adding these two numbers together, as I show here, we find our intrinsic value of the firm's operations to be $15.88 million approximately. If the firm has any non-operating assets, then that would need to be added to value of operations to find value of the firm. In the absence of which, value of the firm's operations becomes your estimate of the intrinsic value of the firm, as I show down here. To find the intrinsic value of the firm's equity, simply subtract the firm's debt 
from your estimated intrinsic value of the firm's operations. So these are the substitutions and uh, we find the intrinsic value of the firm's equity to be 14.38 million. You can also express it on a per share basis by dividing it as I show here by the firm's number of shares outstanding. In this problem it's 4 million shares. So dividing that into the value of the firm's equity we find the intrinsic stock price to be three dollars and sixty cents. So the die is really cast. As we can see the estimated target um, value of the target's equity is uh, with this merger taking place is fourteen point thirty eight million. Now keep in mind that the target firm's current market value is two point eight million. That tells us right there that we expect a merger premium on account of the synergistic benefits of 11.58 million which is the amount by which the intrinsic value your estimated intrinsic value of a firm's equity exceeds the firm's current market capitalization market capitalization is the same thing as market value of equity so now as you can see uh, the bidding range here would be from 70 cents per share which is the target firm's current stock price and three dollars and sixty cents per share which is our estimate of the intrinsic stock price or you can also look at it in terms of uh, total value of equity currently 2.8 million and our estimated intrinsic value is 14.38 million. So the difference between these two numbers represent the merger synergy of uh, uh, synergistic benefits of 11.58 million dollars. So then as you can see the acquirer should not pay uh, more than the estimated intrinsic value of 14.38 million or three dollars and sixty cents per share in order to avoid wealth loss to its stockholders because you don't want to pay more than what you have estimated the firms uh, the firm to be worth if it were to be acquired theoretically actually if the amount tendered is less than 14.38 million somewhere in here then a wealth gain is created for the acquirer stockholders because you believe as the acquirer that if you paid less than you believe the firm is worth if you paid an amount less than 14.38 million any amount in this bidding range then the difference between the amount you have paid say somewhere out here and this amount here would represent value um, wealth gain to your stockholders now if on the other hand um, you pay an amount that exceeds this 14.38 million then as you can see um, you're not doing your uh, stockholders a favor so now of course any amount you pay in here Yes, it is true that you have uh, uh, created wealth for your stockholders, theoretically speaking, but even more importantly, uh, you have uh, uh, created a wealth gain for the stockholders of the target firm. Now, at 70 cents, all merger benefits would go to the acquiring firm because you're paying um, an amount way less than what you believe that the firm is worth. At this point, all merger benefits go to uh, the target firm's shareholders because these guys are getting paid a whole lot more than they are currently worth. Now I, I have to tell you that according to empirical evidence acquisitions um, do in fact create value as a result of economies of scale and other synergies such as uh, operational efficiencies, uh, financial synergies, uh, so so on and so forth. However, these studies show that shareholders of the target firm, not the acquiring firm, reap most of the benefits in that the final price is close to full value. These issues are summarized in this final slide and um, that wraps up this presentation. I'm Pat O.B., Professor of Finance, Purdue University, Calumet.